top business stories live from Sky News City Studio. The International Monetary Fund downgrades its growth forecast for a number of leading economies, including the United Kingdom. The German Chancellor calls for greater access to the Chinese market as he visits Beijing at a time of increasing tension over trade with Europe. Plus, we'll get an insight into the UK's construction sector with the CEO of Billington Holdings as the structural steelwork contractor reports record profits. Good afternoon, this is Business Live with me, Ian King. The International Monetary Fund has downgraded its growth forecast for a number of leading economies, including the UK, this afternoon. The fund is expecting global GDP growth of 3.2% this year, up from 3.1% in January, and has an unchanged forecast of 3.2% growth next year. The United States is predicted to enjoy the strongest growth in the G7 group of advanced economies this year at 2.7%, while Germany is expected to suffer the weakest growth at just 0.2%. The IMF predicts that the UK's GDP will contract by uh, expand by just half of 1% in 2024, a slight downgrade from its previous estimates in January, compared with global growth, as I say, of 3.2%. But things look better next year, with GDP expected to increase by 1.5% in 2025, making it the third best performer in the G7. On inflation, the IMF forecasts that the UK will remain at around 2.5% for the rest of this year, but will fall towards the Bank of England's target of 2% next year. Well, joining me now is Anna Rosenberg. She's head of geopolitics at Amundi Institute. Anna, welcome to you. A, a difficult time for the IMF to be publishing these forecasts, given the, the extent of the geopolitical uncertainty right now. Yes, absolutely. And I think we can assume that all the finance ministers and central bankers meeting in DC right now are going to be talking a lot about geopolitics, something which economists are not necessarily very comfortable in doing, but have increasingly had to do. What would, if you were at the IMF, what would be the key risks that you'd be trying to build into your modelling? Well, clearly what's going to happen in the Middle East, of course, also the, the tensions between the US and China, likely changes um, from the next US administration, the developments in the war in Russia, Ukraine, and the overall geopolitical changes and realignments that we are witnessing, because they're not just about politics, they're affecting trade flows, FDI flows, economics more broadly. One of the things I thought was very interesting, what the IMF said, is the extent to which they think the US and China are now going to dominate global GDP in years to come. They see those two economies as being more important over coming years. Yes, I think that is, uh, that is right. When you see also the, the race for technology, it's clearly between the US and China at this point. And it's also why the US is focusing so much on containing China's technological rise. When you see all the export restrictions and the controls that the Biden administration has put in so far, they have been about technology. Right. So so there's a clear um, competition. It's a great power competition, which is likely going to get worse and not better, no matter who sits in the White House in by, by the time next January starts. Now, in terms of developed economies, obviously, they have the US as the leading uh, player this year and Canada actually uh, growing more strongly next year. But it's India and China, really. That's where that's where all the growth is coming from globally, India in particular. Yes, I think India... So when you look at the geopolitical realignment, there are a lot of risks and we see them play out all the time. But there are actually also quite a lot of winners and that is quite interesting and, and India is a clear winner from it. Um, we categorise the winners in three categories. So we have the countries that are winning on influence, we have the countries that are winning because there's so much diversification going on because of US-China tension, because of the war in, in, in Ukraine. But also um, because there, is, uh, there are lots of new alliances and defence contracts being signed between the US and other allies, for example, the Philippines. So we have three buckets of winners and India actually features in quite a lot of these buckets. So it is a, it is a clear um, winner because of all the changes that are taking place. Now, you've mentioned Ukraine a couple of times. One of the sort of disconcerting things in these forecasts is that uh, the IMF makes very clear Western sanctions appear not to have inhibited Russia's ability to grow at all. I mean, Russia's economy looks to be doing quite well. Yes, that is correct. I think uh, there is a, a big question mark over sanctions more broadly. Look at um, Iran. 
and what Iran is capable to do uh, militarily these days. When you think about how long Iran has been enduring sanctions, the sophistication of its military arsenal is quite uh, staggering. And Russia absolutely has been able to continue uh, witnessing economic growth and pursuing the war despite all the sanctions. So there uh, probably needs to be a reshift to revisit how sanctions can meet their objectives. All right, Anna, we have to leave it there, I'm afraid. Good to see you today. Thank you. Our hopes of an imminent cut in interest rates were dampened today with news that wages are continuing to rise more rapidly than expected. The Office for National Statistics said that during the three months to the end of February, earnings excluding bonuses rose by 6% year on year. That was down from 6.1% in the three months to the end of January, but higher than the 5.8% expected by economists. The Bank of England has previously said wages growth must slow before it can consider cutting interest rates. Well, the ONS also said that unemployment during the period rose from 3.9% to 4.2%. Now, the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz is in Beijing for trade talks with the Chinese President Xi Jinping. It follows increasing tension over Chinese perceived flooding of goods onto European markets. And it comes as China's economy is doing better than expected, with GDP up by 5.3% during the first quarter of the year. Our Asia correspondent Nicole Johnson has the latest from Beijing. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz is here in Beijing meeting China's President Xi Jinping at a sensitive time in trade relations. Olaf Scholz is walking a fine line. On one hand, he's brought a big delegation of companies, BMW, Mercedes and Siemens, asking for equal access to the vast Chinese market. But on the other hand, there are trade tensions with the European Union and the US accusing China of dumping cheap Chinese products onto the global market. Things like electric vehicles, lithium batteries, solar panels and wind turbines. And EU companies just can't compete. China, for its part, is pushing back. President Xi has said that Chinese products enrich the global supply, ease inflation and are helping the world transition to a low-carbon future. All of this comes as China releases its first quarter GDP of 5.3%, and that beats its own growth target for this year of 5%, which analysts say is ambitious. But there are serious challenges to the Chinese economy, a property sector in crisis, Chinese shoppers aren't buying, so there's weak consumer demand. So what is the government betting on? It's betting on building more factories and a massive boost to exports. Some other business news stories for you now. And the FTSE 100 packaging manufacturer DS Smith has agreed to a takeover by US rival International Paper, filing it at £5.8 billion pounds or £7.8 billion, pounds including debt. The agreement comes after DS Smith previously agreed in principle to a takeover by fellow FTSE 100 packaging group Mondi that valued it at £5.14 billion. Pounds. Well, following the all-share deal, investors in DS Smith will only 33.7% of the enlarged business. DS Smith began life as a box-making business in London's East End in the 1940s. It now employs more than 30,000 people in more than 30 countries. The engineering services company T. Clark has agreed to a takeover by the privately owned Regent Group, valuing it at just under £91 million. T. Clark, which has been listed on the stock market for 75 years, began life as a provider of electric wiring materials that enabled the electrification of royal palaces, including Windsor Castle and St James's Palace. It now provides a range of services to builders and infrastructure providers. Regent, which is owned by the entrepreneur Deep Valacia, is a leading supplier of gas and metering services to industrial and commercial customers in the UK. Shares of Dr Martins fell by as much as 30% today after the footwear group warned it was facing tough trading conditions this year. Dr Martins said its results in the financial year just ended would be in line with market expectations, but in the year just started, profits could be down by two-thirds in a worst-case scenario. It blamed weaker demand in the United States, its largest market. The company also said that the chief executive, Kenny Wilson, who oversaw the, its flotation in 2021, will be stepping down at some point over the next 12 months. And the owner of the UK franchise for the TGI Fridays restaurant chain has agreed to buy the brand's US parent for £177 million, including debt. 
Host More Group said the proposed transaction would reunite two businesses that are a natural fit and were one business as recently as 2014. Well, TGI Fridays Inc. is the master franchiser to 493 franchised outlets, including 128 in the US, the 89 in the UK operated by Host More itself, and 276 across a further 42 countries. Shares of Host More have risen by two and three quarter percent on the news. But if you're seeking an insight into the construction sector, few businesses are better placed to comment than Billington Holdings. The Barnsley-based company is one of the UK's leading structural steelwork contractors, as well as being a leading provider of stairs and temporary edge protection barriers to the construction sector and the hoardings seen around building sites. Today it reported a pre-tax profit of £10.3 million for 2023. That was a record for the business and up from £5.8 million in 2022. Well, joining me now is Mark Smith. He's chief executive of Billington Holdings. Uh, Mark, good to see you this afternoon. Um, you make the point that overall consumption of structural steel work in the UK last year was, was unchanged on 2022, yet you've raised your sales by 53%. I assume that's down to the mix changing, is it? Um, it is a little bit of the mix changing, but it's fair to say we've, we've had a, a better run at the market share. Um, well, the, the predictions are that um, during 2024, we're going to see a slight regression in the market. Um, we're quite proud to be delivering not only these results of 2023, but we've recently um, announced a, a haul of, of contract wins um, of 90 million for the business that will see a good order book um, through 24 um, and into 25. So, um, yes, we're seeing a little bit of a dip before the structural steelwork market returns to expected growth back in 2025. No, you've uh, preempted my next question. I, I was interested in these new contract wins. I think that 90 million is across six contracts. What sort of uh, businesses are we talking about? Well, principally, it's really three. Um, we've always delivered um, a specialist contractor into the energy from waste sector with the government's uh, desire to be a net exporter of energy. Um, energy from waste is a good news message. Um, we're taking essentially um, housing waste and uh, converting it to energy. These small power plants then we've helped um, deliver with partner contractors. Uh, part of the 90 and the biggest part of the 90 million contract hall is a energy from waste um, development at the North London boroughs. Um, we're led to believe it's the second largest in the world. And so that, that features a large part of it. Again, we've got a, um, a very large online retail distribution warehouse in Hull and also high tech um, food processing uh, development in Derby. All of those feature in that 90 million. We've also got a lot of opportunities running forward as well, um, along a similar specialist sector line. Um, including further energy from waste developments, um, which we're hoping to secure for uh, later in 24 and into 25. Good mix of businesses there. How is the uh, move by Tata Steel in Port Talbot? They're switching from blast furnaces to electric arc furnaces. Is that going to have any impact on you? Um, it, all it will do is, is secure a UK steel manufacturing industry. Um, we're a client of Tata and uh, we're pleased to see that they're actually moving across to a, a greener um, steel production method. Um, so we support that. Uh, we also buy from British Steel and I know it's their ambition to do exactly the same again with electric arc furnaces to be constructed in Scunthorpe and in Teesside in time. And again, hopefully they're looking for government support for that. All this does is it, it actually reinforces the competitive market for us because we're able to buy not only from European and world steel manufacturers, but also we have a homegrown UK steel producer, which is so important for us steel contractors. You make the point in the statement that steel, steel prices actually softened during the year. What are your expectations for the next 12 months? Um, it's really softened on, on volume, really, more than anything else. Um, we have, during the year, um, seen sort of a dip in volume, really, as developments are stalled um, on cost of borrowing and, and interest rates. As those soften, we feel as though the steel price has really bottomed out now. It's hit that, that level. It was at all-time highs as a result of the Russian-Ukraine um, crisis. 
um, and, so, and a shortage of, of raw material and steel supply. However, that's now equalised back to a level. As the volumes in the steel industry and the construction industry return, we're expecting small increases and gradual increases uh, throughout, I guess, later on in the year and into 25, but more modest than the um, sort of volatile steel price increases we have seen previously. Now tell me about the hoardings business. You're, you're making more of your hoardings graffiti proof and uh, adding anti-climb coatings to them as well. Does that put up the price? Um, well, we like to charge for good servicing. Um, so the whole point of our hoarding system is that it's, it's environmentally friendly. Um, instead of actually digging a hole and concreting a post and that, that material scrap, this is reused with the use of a surface amount of concrete, concrete block. We offer added benefit in terms of the marketing um, that then also can be clamped on and the marketing and the boards are reused. So um, that, that business has grown year on year. Um, we both hire it and sell the hoarding. But if we sell it, we want to buy it back. So hence we can, we can then make use of it being truly environmental. Again, it's now the second largest um, group company within our, our group. Good to hear. Mark, we've got to leave it there, I'm afraid. Thanks very much for joining me today. It's good to catch up with you. Thank you. And you. Thank you. Still to come here on Business Live, we'll have a look at how the markets have done this afternoon. Don't go away. Crawford and I'm Sky's special correspondent based in Istanbul. This is going to be the biggest party Tripoli has ever seen. That's it. it, it got us then. There's a lot of action going on, a lot of heat still. We aim to be the best and the most trusted place in news. This is the cocktail of drugs which the doctors at this hospital have been giving their coronavirus patients. Made for people who want clarity in an uncertain world. Mother Nature is, can be vicious, absolutely savage. The world's largest falls now down to a trickle in places. I can't imagine how much plastic is lying at the bottom of this huge lake. Whoa! <laughs> close and personal with the rhino. This is what makes the job so fantastic.
this is the game changer seat. Look, it even comes with binoculars. Fly Emirates, fly better. Welcome back. A bit of breaking news to bring you. Not uh, terribly good news, I'm afraid. A four-year-old boy has died from his injuries following a fire in a house in Wigan on Sunday. Emergency services responded to reports of a house fire at around 2.30 that morning. A 45-year-old man died from his injuries on the day. We'll have more on that view later on throughout the evening. European stocks have finished sharply lower this afternoon following falls on Wall Street last night and declines in the Asia-Pacific region overnight. This is how mainland Europe has finished all of the main indices around 1.5% or so lower. Well, here in London, it's a similar picture with the FTSE 100. That is off by more than one and three quarter percent in a broad-based sell-off. I think there are only about two gainers in the FTSE today. In percentage terms, well, the biggest fall was Scottish Mortgage Investment Trust, obviously that on the back of a weaker US tech sector. That was off nearly three and three quarter quarter percent. A lot of corporate news outside the FTSE today. The staffing group Robert Walters has fallen by nearly 7% following a trading update, while Hayes has fallen by some 4.5% in sympathy. The defence technology group Kinetic is also lower today, off by nearly uh, 6 and 3 quarter percent. That's on a trading update. While Superdry is off 28 percent, that's after it confirmed a story from Sky's Mark Kleiman yesterday about a financial restructuring. The company has also announced plans to delist from the London market. Not too many gainers to mention today, but Wood Group, uh, we had the chief executive on the programme a couple of weeks ago, you might recall. Well, it's risen by 1.5 percent, and that is on news that an activist investor is urging the company to put itself up for sale or relist elsewhere. Over on Wall Street, it's been a mixed opening. That's the Nasdaq, more or less unchanged right now, actually. Uh, among the uh, features today, Morgan Stanley has risen by some three and a quarter percent. That's after its first quarter results came in ahead of expectations, while United Health has risen by five and a half percent for similar reasons. To the downside, Bank of America has fallen by nearly five percent after well, actually it's uh, rallied now. It's off uh, four percent now. That's after its quarterly profits were hit by higher loan loss provisions. On the foreign exchange markets, well, the big news today. Uh, concerns the uh, US dollar and the yen. Uh, the yen at a 34-year low against the greenback. Sterling little changed on that jobs data right now. None of those major currency pairs moving very much. As for the oil price, well, that has rallied in the last hour or so. Barrel of Brent crude currently changing hands at $90.31 a barrel, up a quarter of 1%. Well, joining me now is Janet Mui, Head of Market Analysis at RBC. Bruin Dolphin, Janet, great to see you this afternoon. Um, mixed bag of results from uh, the banks in uh, Wall Street this afternoon. Talk me through it. Yeah, uh, good, good afternoon, Ian. Thanks for having me. So uh, you mentioned that uh, Morgan Stanley stock prices were up, and uh, it is because, actually, they posted strong results in its trading divisions and capital markets and there are uh, early signs that the IPO market is uh, picking up. So I think that's great news considering Morgan Stanley is a bank very exposed to investment banking activity. So I think that that is uh, great news. Uh, and also is uh, net interest margin also beat analyst expectation. And its wealth management division also did great. So in terms of the Bank of America, its share prices were down. I think you know, they, they actually had some good results. But primarily, analysts are worried about the higher credit card charge-off, as you mentioned, the higher loan, bad loan provisions, and also higher expenses that were incurred. So that offsets some of the, you know, better results from the other divisions. Yeah, interesting uh, to look at Morgan Stanley in particular. I mean, very similar to uh, what we heard from Goldman Sachs yesterday, who had their best results for, for several years uh, on the quarter. Investment banking coming back. Yeah, I think uh, we have to consider the context, which is that uh, deals have 
pretty much slumped uh, last year. And because of the better market conditions this year, uh, as we know, the equity markets have rallied. Uh, actually, that helped with trading activity and also enticing uh, some of the businesses back to thinking about potentially uh, IPOs and more M&A activity. So that is a benefit to investment banks like Goldman Sachs and Warren Stanley. Whereas, say, Bank of America, it is very exposed to the consumer business. As I, as I mentioned, the credit card you know, losses, uh, analysts were worried about that. So it's a bit, you know, I do think credit in that bank earnings story. Yeah, I mean, we're only a little way through the uh, Q1 earnings report so far. Is it too early to sort of draw, draw any broader conclusions? Yeah, I think it is, it is a bit too early because so far we are still awaiting the, the big tech mega cap results and that would be very, very crucial as with the so-called Magnificent Seven. Uh, I think will be very much scrutinized because I think the expectations are uh, pretty high uh, and the stock prices have rallied very significantly. I, I think we're in a very early stages. I think so far we've got the banks. The good news is that the bank executives were saying the economy is resilient and consumer balance sheet is strong and they're still spending. Yeah, well, on that point, we were talking about the IMF earlier on. I mean, the US is clearly growing very, very strongly just yeah. now. The IMF more or less hinting it's going to be very hard for the uh, Federal Reserve to cut interest rates at all this year, which is quite striking. I think it is difficult because if you look at what they forecast on the US economy, it's just really, really strong because uh, they upgraded their forecast uh, for this year, GDP growth from 2.1% to 2.7%. And what you're talking about is an acceleration in growth from last year's 2.5%. And that's basically growing more than five times that of UK GDP growth this year, which they forecast to be 0.5%. So that is a very strong macro environment, which makes it difficult for, cut, uh, for the Fed to cut. Yeah, no doubt in your mind the ECB goes before everyone else now. Yeah, I think that is the market consensus. And there are many reasons why. First of all, they guided that. Uh, Christine Lagarde basically say June is on the table very much. And also the economic environment is much weaker than the US. The IMF is expecting 0.8% GDP growth for this year, for example. All right, Janet, got to leave it there. Good to see us ever. Thank you. That's it from me. I'm back at half past 11 tomorrow morning. Hope very much to see you then. In the meantime, coming up next, it's the News Hour with both Mark Austin and Yalda Hakim. Do stay tuned for that. Thanks for joining me today. See you tomorrow. Cheerio.